three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode 90 of the Citrix Session. I'm your host, Andy Whiteside. Got a, got a special guest with us today. Uh, first, I'll introduce Bill, Bill Sutton, Director of Services. Bill, how's it going? Going well, Andy. Thank you. And you? Good. Good seeing you in person last week. We got in front of some customers, and it was, uh, it was awesome to get in front of customers. It was also interesting to see how these lifelong or multi-year customers of yours, uh, no matter who was in the room, they just want to talk to you. That's, that's power. <laughs> yeah, that's, uh, that's uh, rather validating, but uh, yeah, it's nice to to see that it still sticks. Yeah, well, you help somebody one time, especially in this world, um, especially in the world of Citrix, and all of a sudden they uh, they don't forget you. No, you're right. Uh, I got Monica Grissomer with her uh, with us. Monica, uh, your blog from uh, What's New in Virtual Apps and Desktops, September 2021. Uh, glad to have you on with us. Yeah, thanks, Andy. Thanks, Bill. Glad to be here. I've been here a couple to a handful of times before, so it's great to be back. If any of you on the on the line here don't know me. My name is Monica Grismer. I am in product marketing for Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops. And yeah, every quarter we have a lot of great stuff coming. So excited to talk about what happened in Q3 today. Well, we've got a um, got a lot to cover, so we're going to jump into it. And before I do that, let me promote Ben Rogers to a panelist because he's here now. And we'll just hit him. We'll hit him right when he comes in, and off we'll go. Hey, Ben Rogers, you with us? Ben looks like he's on me. Anyway, uh, there he is. He's coming into focus. So, Ben, we were just getting ready to jump into the uh, the blog, and you showed up, so we thought we would pause and, and get you introduced as the uh, healthcare sales engineer, also local sales engineer for Citrix here in the Carolinas. Ben, how's it going? I'm doing well, Andy. How are you doing? I'm, I'm good. There's so much going on that uh, I almost feel like I'm overwhelmed uh, right now in the world of my, my world, but it's all, it's all good stuff. As long as you keep it in perspective. I hear you. I just, uh, had a weekend of upgrading my devices to windows 11. So that's, what's had me a little delayed. I had to take care of a few things and answer a few questions technically to get into this bad boy. So I appreciate the patience while I ran a little late. You know, I could, we could go down a whole podcast of how that went, but we'll, uh, we'll save that for a later date. Good thing you got all your virtual apps and desktops available in the cloud. So no matter how it went, you were going to be you were going to be safe, right? <laughs> That's true. Very true. All right. So Monica's uh, blog that we're covering here today um, is about uh, the up updates to virtual app and desktops, and it you know that's probably going to be the service as well as the on premises. But uh, we're going to cover that. Uh, Monica, I love in the uh, first um, first paragraph here you talk about the Citrix story, which. For all the things that have come and gone and always the latest, greatest stuff, the uh, the virtual app and desktop, a.k.a. Metaframe, Winframe, presentation server, virtual app and desktop, that stuff still tried and true. And you guys continue to invest in uh, that solution, right? Yes, absolutely. I mean, VDI and DAS, the DAS market has been is now hotter than ever. So it's really great to be on the receiving end of it and get to experience firsthand how we can evolve our story and evolve to where our customers are going. Because as time goes on, as the pandemic is in phase, I don't know, five, six, seven, whatever, whatever phase of the pandemic we see ourselves in, are in and hopefully coming out of, the world of remote working has forever been changed. The world of cloud computing has forever been changed. So us as the Citrix Virtual Apps and Desktops team, we're excited to evolve with that for sure. I've gotten to the point where when I'm talking to somebody not in our industry and they're asking me what it is we focus on, I just bring up the fact that we used to sell technologies in case a pandemic happened. And now we sell technologies because it's been proven that it can happen. Yep. 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 And then they, then they come back, oh, you remote work. Like, no, no, hybrid work. Just as important to be able to work when you're there as well as when you're not there. And you know, if you understand that concept, then we're in business. Absolutely. So, Monica, this section here where we start to jump into some of the new releases, um, can you clarify for me uh, my comment a minute ago around whether it's the service, you know, virtual app and desktop service, or just virtual app and desktop? What, what's covered in these features, um, or is it a little mix and match of all of the above? Yep, I'd say it's the final thing that you said. So, on the CVAD team, we really look at holistically what happens quarter after quarter. So within these blogs, a team member of mine, we have one that comes out in March, July, September, and December. I believe those are the final months of the quarters. Um, and we 
have conversations around not only what's happening on premises, but also what's happening in the cloud. So how I started off this blog was talking about our on premises releases, and then we'll get more into some of the cloud features. But as we kick into it, 2109 was our latest current release on premises, and that came out at the end of September and had a lot of great things in it. So I know we talk cloud, we talk DAS, but the thing is, is we love our on-premises customers. You all know that firsthand. And they're, they're what keep us doing what we're doing. And Ben can also attest to our great healthcare customers. A lot of them are on-prem and we're still investing in that platform. So 2109 was our latest current release and we can get into some features there as well. Does that answer your question, Andy? It does. And as you're going through this, which I'm sure you will, you'll you'll call out which ones are for on-premises and which ones are for the cloud service and which ones are for both, uh, I'm sure, right? Yes, absolutely. So before we go here, uh, Bill and Ben are very uh, knowledgeable people in our industry. Guys, anything specific around the, the conversation we've had up to this point that you want to chime in on what Monica's saying? I'll go. Uh, I think she said something very poignant there that I see every day, and that's healthcare still has a predominant uh, data center infrastructure, and they're probably going to stay that way for a while. I mean, it's hard for them to imagine. You know, you look at some of these CEOs of these large healthcare facilities, it's hard for them to imagine not having control of their database or not having the security built around that database. So that's still a big paradigm shift that we see customers going through. They'll continue to go through it. Uh, you know, we do see some give of some of the smaller applications, you know, uh, coming to cloud, letting that release. But to get to the patient data and where that lives, we still got some work to do. So I'm very proud of the fact uh, that Citrix is still developing the on-prem environment and enhancing that. So I definitely agree with the comment there. Yeah, I would echo that, obviously. So Monica, let's jump into the first bullet you have here because I know we've got a ton to cover, which is awesome. Yeah, we do. Uh, HDX, or for the old school guys, ICA, but the uh, high definition experience adaptive audio portion of HDX. Uh, what is this covering? Yeah, so I opened our kind of laundry list of on-premises features, and this will actually straddle on-prem and cloud. But the new HDX adaptive audio feature introduces a new audio codec for improved playback. So it has audio redirection and playback. So this is the first time in I think a year or two that we've really enhanced that audio playback functionality within the session. And this new audio codec will be the basis of our audio enhancements going forward. So this is exciting for, you know, user experience and playback, especially in this remote work world. Now, is this intended for multimedia or is this intended for like bi-directional call center type stuff? What's the, what's I, the play? I believe it's more multimedia focused. So okay. more playback on your device rather than conversations like we're having today. But we also have optimizations for things like Team, Zoom, WebEx to optimize calls like this. Yeah. Uh, next one is drag and drop support in Outlook messages. Yeah. So this is just a feature. Um, that we introduced on-prem, I believe you can do it in cloud as well. I believe any of these on-prem features you can do in cloud, but I'll call that out if we can't. So this is just more of a feature to have um, native-like experience within Outlook. So the drag and drop of messages. And then um, the VC allow list, I believe too, is just more, that's the next one. And that's um, having the functionality disabled by default because that could be a, a security issue as well. So those were two slightly smaller enhancements, but definitely important as well. I'm reading the uh, virtual channel allow list. So basically no virtual channels, and then you can enable them by default disable, but then you can enable the ones you want or vice versa. Correct. Yeah. Uh, edit, uh, excuse me, EDT, uh, Enlightened Display Transport Protocol, uh, your version of a kind of UDP slash TCP fallback. Uh, MTU Discovery for Mac and Android. I guess that worked on Windows. I think we covered that a while back. Yep. Uh, but now it's uh, now it works when communicating with an endpoint that's uh, Apple, Mac, or mm -hmm. Android, Android. Yep. Yep. Just thought that was worth calling out because, as you said, there's been a lot of conversations around EDT MTU Discovery. Our customers like it a lot. So we're just continuing to get parity across platforms. Yeah. 
I think this would also add into our relationship with Google, especially with the Android part of it, is getting the Chromebooks and those things more in line with having, you know, the power and the optimization that we bring to the Windows. I think this is going to be something really good for us going forward when we talk to non-Windows crowds. And, and you know, we were talking about, I was talking about my upgrade with Windows 11. It's gone very well, not a knock on it, but there's some things I've had to deal with that, uh, I could see where other people might choose other platforms and there's a lot of attraction with companies looking at Chromebooks. So I think this is going to be where people like me can go into customers and look at them and go, no, I can give you the same experience that you've had in a windows environment on a Chromebook or a Mac platform. Mm -hmm. No, absolutely. Ben. And thanks for bringing that up. Yeah. Don't tell on me team. Cause I know we're a windows house, but I operate on a Mac all day. Because for marketing, you know, I, I like it better. I, I like the responsiveness of it. But I, you know, love getting my job done within my virtual session and being able to use my Mac. So it's becoming more and more prevalent. And yeah, being device agnostic is huge. Yeah, as you guys were talking, I've reached behind me. I've got a Lenovo device that I can either boot into uh, iGel or I can boot into uh, Google Cloud Ready. Um, it, it really does open up the world a lot of options and simplicity. At the same time, five minutes ago, I was online looking to buy a new uh, Microsoft Surface laptop. So all over the place. But uh, having Citrix Linux, uh, the Linux story on par with everything else is, is huge. So let's go to the first one. Uh, Red Hat uh, 8.4 and CentOS support. Yep. Just calling out that we support those um versions of those operating systems on Linux. So our Linux VDA story really continues to grow and get fleshed out in tandem with our Windows VDA story. So this is really exciting. We just, again, I kind of rapid fired features within this blog to show all of the features that we're bringing to Linux VDA, because I think sometimes that doesn't get talked about enough or customers may not understand that they can leverage Linux VDAs. Are you all seeing that in the field as well? Are you having these conversations? Um, it's kinda, I mean, we're seeing mm -hmm. it in the form of uh, you know, through, through iGel, maybe through Google Cloud Ready, which is not nearly enough of that. Um, but yeah, it's happening by proxy of the, um, the, in, the software manufacturers bringing, like I literally just booted this laptop into a, a USB drive and I, I forget how I made the thing actually now. Um, but yeah, it, we're seeing more of it. Um, but most of the time when it comes to like what you have here with uh, Red Hat and Scent OS, it's the, uh, it's the propeller head guys, which I just happened to be on a plane last week uh, beside a guy that uh, he runs Linux for his home computer. And, uh, you know, it's very unusual to find that person in a crowd. Hey, but let me say this, uh, Ben, you just went through the uh, Windows 11 upgrade. Monica, you're very tied in here and Bill, you're a knowledgeable technology industry guy. If I were to say that within the next 12 months, Microsoft will come out with a Linux operating system, what do you think? Uh, they've been talking about that forever. I, 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 I certainly think it's possible, but uh, I don't know with Windows 11 in the mix. I, I don't know that I think that, I don't know that I'd see that, but you never know. Monica, yeah, agreed. I agree there. Um, I think it's it's a watch and wait kind of thing because I don't I believe for a while they weren't going to come out with another Windows OS, but here we are. Yeah. Uh, so was, it's always a curiosity. That was just marketing at the time. That wasn't <laughs> that minute they came out with minute they said that they came out with a new version. Like you know, two months later, it was a new new build new thing. Yeah. Build. Yeah. After the Windows eight debacle, they needed something to say that they had it all figured out. Ben, what's your thoughts on Microsoft having a Linux OS someday? Uh, I'm not real sure. I mean, I, I could see the possibilities there. I mean, it would be an, it would be an endeavor for them. And you know, what I, just what where I wonder about that is, you know, what is it going to replace? Is that is that going to become the new interface? I mean, I will tell you, I've read a couple of articles this weekend where I could be wrong with this, and and you know, our listeners, please correct me. Uh, it, Windows 11 is very similar to Windows 10 as far as the core. I don't think they did a lot with the core itself, the core program, the core OS. A lot of this is the enhancements they needed to make. Like it's a lot easier to get to things. Uh, there's one or two things I've been disappointed with so far. The start menu's kind of been funky for me. But uh, 
I don't know. That's an interesting topic. I was kind of, my mind was going more to this, you know, especially when you start getting down into now we're bringing smart court court access to the scene is, you know, it is becoming where we can adopt a Linux environment into a windows environment using the Citrix platform, because really the endpoint is getting to the point. It doesn't matter anymore. We're able to deliver across so many platforms. Now we're able to do it it, you know, with strength, we don't have to look at customers and go, oh, if you do this, you're going to lack this. Or if you do this, you're going to lack this. We can look at them and go, yeah, go down the path you want to, and we'll support you and we'll support you just like we do the almighty Microsoft. And so it's, it's very interesting to me that I know right now it's propeller heads, but we got a younger generation coming online, uh, more savvy generation. As we've talked about, they're not used to a traditional desktop like we are. Uh, I think Monica could, te- could contest to that. So I see as we get more portal based and device agnostic that there's going to be a market in a place for all of this. And whether Microsoft comes on board with it, I don't know. But man, good opportunity for Google. I think a good opportunity for Red Hat as well. Right. Yeah, I, um, I'll go on the record and say within the next 12 to 24 months, Microsoft will have a Linux Linux distribution, just like they took Edge and Edge and based it on Chrome. They'll They'll take an operating system. They'll still have Windows 11 or Windows whatever, uh, but they'll have one based on Linux, I believe. So let me ask you, public, corporate, or personal consumption? What market you think they're going to go for? All the above. I mean, I literally just booted up this uh, Linux, excuse me, Lenovo unit into uh, Google's Linux. Uh, it, the hard drive has uh, cloud-ready enterprise. The, uh, the the nub that I put in a USB drive has home edition. They're going to do exactly what these guys are doing. They're going to want to, a Chromebook type cloud first device and they'll have it within the next uh, 24 months, I believe. All right. Uh, next one been highlighted or, or alluded to uh, smart card support. Again, talking about the Linux uh, workspace app for uh, Debian. And, and that's one of the challenges here too. There's a, I'm going to use my good Southern slang here. There's a crap ton of uh, Linux distributions to try to figure out. And Citrix is, I guess, having to chase all of them, right? Yeah, I'd say so. Um, I I think our Linux um, conversations are definitely driven by customers that are leveraging it today and specific functionality that they need. So we're really listening and paying attention to what our customers need in the market. So yeah, I mean, there's a number of different configurations, but continuing to try to roll along and stay in front of our customers. So smart card was one of those asks. And then virtual display layout you're highlighting. That was a functionality that's been within Windows for a little while now, but this really improves user experience across multi-monitors. So I know that was an ask internally as well. Is this the one where you could take a single monitor, big or small, and create multiple monitors inside a single monitor? Is that what this one is? Yes. Cool. I haven't played with that in a while. I need to. So, Monica, let me ask a question for that. My boss, Jeremy Myers, I know you know Jeremy. He's got one of these big old 49-inch monitors, you know, super uh, high def. And one of the things he touts is he can do exactly what you're talking about. He can have a desktop in one side of it, a desktop in the middle, and a desktop on the right side. Is this what this addresses where you can have those big wraparound monitors and you can carve those things up in the different desktops? Yes. Um, Yeah, that was our functionality we introduced in Windows, I think maybe a couple years ago now. I don't know. I've, I was just talking to Bill at the beginning of this, how time has basically no meaning, especially over the past year, it slipped away from me. But yes, you can, um, you can cut one monitor into multiple logical monitors. So that, yeah, this is exciting functionality. That is hot. That is hot, man. That is killer. That's awesome to see. Yeah, let, let Jeremy know I need some money so I can buy some of those big fancy monitors he's got. <laughs> I'd like one of those too. <laughs> no, I think it's going to become more and more mainstream. So absolutely the ability to get out of a, you, you still need your multi-monitors, but you can do it in one piece of uh, equipment. You guys can't tell this right now, but I'm on the stand-up desk, goes up and down. I can't, I can't have a bunch of monitors on this thing because when I pick them up, there's a chance they're all going to fall off. Fair. Well, to, to Jeremy, to Jeremy's defense here, uh, he's, he's a hard worker, you know, and, and he, he needs to play with the latest and greatest toys, but the price of those things have come considerably down to where, Old Ben's looking at Santa Claus going, please put one of those in the, in the stocking for me. So 
we'll have to see. But the price has lowered greatly over the last 18 months because when the pandemic started, I was looking at them and they were god awful expensive. So but ben, now they're becoming reasonable. Define that for me. What size, like physically, what size are you talking about? I would like to go with the ultra wide 49 inch. I think that's what Jeremy's got and what I've been looking at. Uh, I think the traditional model has been the 34 or I'm not sure, but man, I want the 49. And I think that like you can carve this thing, like Jeremy's running three different monitors on it constantly, three different windows of different activity. Uh, it's amazing, you know, and he's, he's running this off the of Microsoft surface laptop. So he's got a laptop plugged into this thing, having that kind of functionality. Now imagine doing that with a VDA. What's, <laughs> would be, the, uh, what's the, dis, what's the monitor resolution in that case? Oh, I don't, I, I have no idea. I mean, you're getting to where these gamers are talking about, but like you, you ask about price when the pandemic started, those things were rolling a little under $2,000. I think I found one the Christmas of, uh, 2019 when I first joined, I think it was like 1899 or something. And I was just looking because Christmas is coming up. Uh, and I think they're down to like 1100, you know, which mm. is still expensive, but it's manageable. You know, the functionality you get, think about buying two 32 inch monitors. I got, I got a great big monitor back here, but behind me, I could, I don't know. Yeah. I don't know what to do with the thing. It's, uh, yeah, these are, these are like ultra high death. And the thing I like is it encases you, it wraps around you. So yeah. our crowd that's listening, you know, I'm sure you guys can input better than this, but it's it's nice and what i what got me excited is now you're not dependent upon windows to have that i can run you know a version of linux on my laptop my older laptops that won't take windows 11 or tired of dealing with microsoft on it and now i can have the same functionality when i log into citrix as i do when I i'm in my windows environment hey let's uh let's move to the next thing uh hdx session screen sharing monica what is this yep um it just enhances the ability for users to share their screens within Linux sessions. Okay. So, yep, has been available on Windows for a while, but just kind of keeping on top of the parity there. Right. And you've, uh, you've got a whole a handful of things you roll through here in the next paragraph uh, yep. after the bullets. Anything in this? That you yeah. Highlight? So wanted to speak to session recording just briefly. Um, I work really closely with our session recording team. So for those of you who don't know, we introduced um, about a year ago, a new web-based player for playback for session recording for sessions. And they've been able to introduce a lot of functionality within that web player. For example, they've introduced the ability to have specific events triggered within sessions. So you don't just have this huge brick of a session recording from a user. You can see what specific items happened within that session. And now this quarter, um, we're really excited to introduce that if you have a session, if you have an event specific, like an event specific trigger where a session will start recording when that event happens. So maybe like a file download or maybe like an application launch or something, the session restart will start recording then. And if that specific event doesn't happen, then the session won't record. So that really helps on storage space. And overall, just making the functionality a lot more dynamic and not as difficult to store. So Keep a lookout for all the great stuff that's happening in session recording. Hey, Monica, are you the only, do, do other players in this space even have session recording? I've never heard anybody else talk about it. I cannot definitively say. I I know we're one of the only, but I don't know if we are the only. I can look into that, though, for sure. Yeah, no worries. And no, Andy. Yeah, go ahead. I, I kind of have a story about session recording that's, that's awesome. Um and I, I don't know if customers really realize how powerful this technology is, but we have a way with our analytics program to actually trip a session recording session off. So one of the things that we're talking with some healthcare clients about is using analytics. And when, you know, you build the indicators and the policies inside of analytics, but you can say, you know, let's say that an employee had an excessive amount of file activity that's really out of their norm you can turn on session recording and actually record their activity. And that has generated a lot of conversation with us with healthcare customers. So uh, I'm glad Monica included this in the blog, but we are seeing some good market traction with this, especially when you bundle this with our analytics package so that we can do it in an automated fashion instead of a manual fashion. 
Totally. Yeah. Thanks, Ben, for bringing that up. I didn't speak to analytics too much in this blog because there's so much going on there. But we are introducing more and more functionality to tie these two together with analytics for security. So I believe coming soon as well, we'll have more events, event triggering within analytics for security. So you can see it across both platforms and, and trigger dynamically within analytics. So yeah, bridging that gap as well has been huge for customers. Yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I mean, why not? If you can, if you can have things that uh, can see deeper into what anybody else can see and then have actions that kick in after that, it's, uh, it's kind of a no-brainer. Yeah, I think I definitely need to check this one out, especially these new features. Very interesting about graphically represent screen time, file activity, and so forth within this session. That's a, that's really a key a key new thing that I wasn't really even aware of until I read this article. Well, I don't I don't want to go off the deep end on this or go down a rabbit hole, but I will tell you from a compliance and a legal standpoint, if you have things going on in your environment and you're questioning what it is to be able to turn this on and to mm -hmm. be able to trip it with our indicators. Uh, a lot of companies are expressing interest in this in, uh, you know, Andy, you made a comment about us being one of the only people in the marketplace. I don't know that I haven't done that search, but again, tying our analytics with this session recording and being able to do it with precision a lot of customers got a lot of interest in that because it helps them on several different fronts, compliance, legal, just a slew of things that CEOs, CIOs, uh, compliance people are like, that's it. That's, that's a good way to introduce some technology. You know, the, the hardest challenge for all of us as, as salespeople, I guess you might say, uh, is getting the word out. Right. And we, Bill and I went to a couple of meetings last week and it's, it's clear that there's a lot of good stuff that's, that's never making it to the, uh, to the admin or the IT manager or the director, things like this. So Monica, the next section talks about uh, Citrix virtual, virtual apps and desktop service, more to love. What are you guys covering here? Yeah, so we kind of shifted gears in this article to talk more specifically about cloud updates. So I introduced um, really just kind of set the stage with how vast cloud deployments are becoming. We recently did a pulse survey of IT admins and almost every single one of them said they're moving some or all of their systems to the cloud. None of us are shocked by that. Even if you're mostly on-prem, you might have burst scenarios in the cloud, now's the time to go. So I kicked it off here with some updates on our service continuity functionality. So for those of you listening who aren't as familiar, that's our cloud resiliency piece. So if there is any interruption in the cloud at all. There's the ability now for individuals to launch apps and desktops. It's kind of like local host cache, but really looks at the full breadth of the service if there's some interruption or outage. So what we introduced here is we introduced this functionality within Windows and Mac, but now we have it in Linux as well as on Chrome and Edge browsers with the browser extension. So service continuity has been huge. I don't know if you all have been talking about it with your customers, but I think that was a barrier to entry for some who weren't moving to cloud. So it's been awesome on our end to see it come to life. So Bill, you're close to our customers in terms of implementations. Is this something that they needed? Yes, it is. It has come up in a number of conversations, um, particularly when there have been you know, some form of an outage. Um, either they've experienced it or they've seen it, you know, in the public, in the in the media. Um, so yeah, we've had conversations around this, and you know, one of the one of the questions that always comes up is, well, we're using the web client. we you know, they're logging in from a Chrome browser or something. How do we how do how do we do that? And it's like, well, you really need the to use the full workspace app to get the functionality. Well, now it looks like that's uh, that 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 statement is no longer valid or not entirely valid anymore. So uh, right, that's good to see. Yeah, so I believe the extension actually, you still need a workspace app client installed, but even yeah. yep, even if you log in from the browser, then the with the extension, it'll launch the yeah. local client. Yeah, I watched so, the video um, before we got on the call. So, oh, awesome. Yeah. You, yeah. you did your homework, Bill. <laughs> That's great. So Bill, as the guy who watched the video, <laughs> tell us what it does in 30 seconds or less. Oh gosh, in 30 seconds or less. Sure. Uh, basically, you've got a plug in for uh, Chrome and Edge. You've got to have the, like Monica said, you've got to have the full workspace app client installed, but you don't have to be actually, you know, configure it and use it regularly. 
Um, and in essence, with that plugin, uh, as long as it's turned on to, to reconcile the two, it will capture the um, launch files, if you will. It's not really the ICA files. I forget what they call them. Um, now that I think I can't remember what they actually call them, but it's actually uh, session files, I believe, that get downloaded to your into the local client. Uh, and then when you launch it, it actually launches it using the file if there's an outage. Um, it does require the user to log into the Windows OS. So they'll see the window. It doesn't cache their credentials. It just caches the connection. And, and Bill, when it's an outage, are you saying if there's like the gateways down and now they're using the public IP, what, what, how is it getting? I know we covered this at one point, but it's been a while. They have the user has to have IP connectivity to the to the resource, obviously. Okay. So if they're sitting, you know, if they're sitting in the office or they're on a VPN, then then they'll be able to get in. Um, I believe if the cloud connectors are up, it may still be they may still be able to get through that. I'd have to check on that though. Monica, do you know how that works in terms of getting a path to the um, BDA? So. Uh, yeah, I believe it has to do with the cloud connectors. I would have to double check as well. Mm -hmm. yeah, no okay, uh, Ben, any comments on that technology? I think this is a, this is definitely value to our customers. It's, it's hard for me to, uh, you know, have delved in this a lot with healthcare because, you know, healthcare, really the best practice from Citrix is you've got the ADC on-prem and storefront. And even though we're moving a lot of people's configuration and control plane in the cloud for best practice for redundancy or failover, we still want to have those pieces there. So I need to do a little bit more research on this. Uh, but with that being kind of the, 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 the best practice in healthcare, that's kind of where I've leaned a little bit to on that. So, uh, no, I've got some research to do on this. I'm glad they're enhancing it. I'm glad they brought it to other other platforms or bringing it to other platforms. But I haven't had a lot of experience with it just because of my specialty in healthcare and, and just looking at the way we have our best practices now. Hey, Ben, I don't want to brag or anything, but I just upgraded the uh, cloud ready version of the Google Linux operating system during that last topic and it's ready to go. Really? Yeah. All right. Now, are you are you going to bust bad on this to start doing your teams and everything from there? I certainly could. My biggest yeah. challenge is the form factor. Uh, I just don't have the docking station for it. Uh, but for yeah. probably two years, I actually did use that as my primary operating system, and, no, and nobody knew. Yeah. I mean, I, I I did like you said, man. I eat my own dog food, so I come in. You know, that's where this Windows 11 thing hadn't hurt so bad. Is that most of this morning I've worked from my Citrix environment. So I've been able to keep chugging in them. It's just my problems are a little convenience problems that I'm having right now, but I've uh, been all good stuff, dude. I definitely see a day of virtual only and all this thing that we carry around with us is just a dumb piece of hardware that gets us to our services that we've subscribed to. Yeah. Well, that's why I'm so bullish on the fact that Microsoft will have a Linux operating system at some point. They want that same type of, of bulletproofness. Um, Monica, this uh, next section talks about monitoring, which I think that's related to director and the ability to get 365 days of, of insight by default versus the 90. Yep, correct. So that's actually for our Citrix virtual apps and desktops premium service customers. So anyone with that premium edition or workspace premium plus now have 365 days of data retention. And you're correct, Andy, that is director. It just falls under the monitor tab within cloud. So instead of the previous 90, but customers with standard and advanced editions have the, the 90 day still, this is premium only. Okay. Well, it's, it's interesting because as my head's thinking through that, I'm like, well, that's not a big deal. That was easy enough, but can't, I can't imagine the back end sizing and things that had to go mm -hmm. into making that decision. So uh, kudos to Citrix for investing and in giving more value in the premium licensing subscription. Uh, all right, a couple other key things, uh, automation configuration tool updates. Um, you want to hit that one? Yep, it's just uh, pretty straightforward. The automated configuration tool um, allows customers to migrate dedicated MCS catalogs from on-prem to cloud, so it helps with time to migrate. Uh, rescheduling or restart scheduling in studio, I guess. Uh, what, what happened there? Because I guess I'm a little out of touch. I don't manage my environments much anymore. Yep, so they can just now set custom times and dates for maintenance. So sometimes, I believe previously, it might update on its own and it might not be at a, a correct time for the admin. So now they can just schedule a restart time within Studio. 
Okay. Just so it doesn't get in the way of day-to-day -day activities. Right. And uh, Azure AD admin support group, uh, I guess that's one of the predefined groups in the uh, service. Yes. So um, just Azure AD groups can be directly onboarded into Citrix uh, Cloud. Gotcha. Gotcha. That makes sense. Bill, Ben, any uh, questions, comments on these three? I think the second one, restart scheduling in studio, I think this is probably MCS related, Monica. So, you know, when you go to update a catalog, it actually says, do you want to restart now? Do you want to restart when the user logs off? And maybe this is, uh, you can set a time for it now. So not sure though, that would be uh, interesting. Yeah, I believe so. Um, my, my colleague helped me with these, so I can follow up with him too, if yeah. that's specific to MCS. I, like I said, there, this is a, I don't know if I said this from the jump, but this is definitely a team effort and an amalgamation yeah. of all of my colleagues' help. So I'm an expert on more than others. Monica, you don't I'm, know it, it, <laughs> so, I wish I did. I'm really trying to. No. Really trying to. <laughs> you know what? My biggest quality in IT people are the ones that can admit they don't know it all. The ones that can't, yeah, you don't come work here. Yeah. I, I was going to say, Monica, when you figure that out, why don't you share it with me? Because I've been searching for that talent for 30 years. Yeah. Sounds I kind of equate it to my golf game. You know, in golf, you got drivers, irons, wedges, and putters. And I can get one of those right. If I could just get all four of them right, I would be doing fantastic. But I'm still chasing 100. So totally. there we go. No, for me, the, the biggest thing for me out of these three is the top one where we're just enhancing our migration tools because, yep. you know, you talk to customers and, and you got them, you've got them, uh, slated to go to cloud, then they really start looking at what's the forklift. And sometimes that forklift is, that, that's a big place. So the easier we can make it on our customers to get out there and retain what they're doing today, if they want to do that, enhancing these tools is key. So I'm glad to see we're, we're meeting the mark on that face. So Monica, the next section talks about what you guys are doing around Azure. I know part of it is uh, provisioning services and the other part is um, uh, VMware's uh, solution on top of Azure. Mm -hmm. Want to cover those? Yeah, so wanted to kick this portion off. We added a couple of sections here. We've got one on Azure and one on Google Cloud. So I wanted to preface by saying we're really taking time to invest in these major hyperscalers. So Azure, Google Cloud, and AWS. We have some really great, great things swirling with all three. So that's kind of a little tee up there for things to come and potentially a blog in the future that I'll be on chatting about. But kicking it off with Azure here, we had a couple of great tech previews come out this past quarter. So as you said, PVS on Azure is huge. So that's our beloved provisioning service. And then additionally, um, I believe it's image portability service. So managing a single Windows image that's optimized for multiple resource locations. Those are both in tech preview. Um, I linked to another blog. I'm not sure if the tech previews are still open. I think we had a really good response to those. So those are being fleshed out and will hopefully GA very soon. The bottom paragraph there talks about our support for the Azure VMware solution. So this solution was previously Citrix ready and now we have specific support for it. So anyone that's leveraging AVS or the average VMware solution has full support with Citrix in tandem. Okay, question for you and Bill, and you may not know the answer to this, Bill and I have chatted about it briefly, but you know, Citrix Cloud, Citrix Virtual App and Desktop Service doesn't allow, the on-premises doesn't allow you to connect to, um, you know, Azure, AWS, um, Google Clouds. <clears throat> when we layer on something on top of it, like VMware, like Nutanix, do I then have the ability to connect to it through the on-premises version? Is it technically broken? Is it a, a EULA? Um, uh, a EULA infringement, what, what happens, do you know? I don't, I mean, you and I talked about this last week. I don't, I don't know that uh, we have an answer on that yet. Monica, you, do you know why I'm asking the question? Yeah, I understand. So yeah, we, after CVAD 1912, you're correct. Hey. We, um, we removed the ability to provision from on-premises to public cloud. Um, or the cloud connectors rather. So I am not 100% sure. I know with 1912, the functionality is there. I'm not 100% sure going forward what breaks and doesn't break, but I, I assume with this support, 
it, it wouldn't break if you leverage it in the cloud, but I can double check. I That's a totally valid question though, Andy. I'm, I'm sure there's something in there. If not technically, then EULA, but eventually there will be. I mean, the, as, as you guys start to, as it starts to kind of minutia, kind of, and I'm, uh, as it starts to come together, the different on-premises and cloud stories, and mm -hmm. um, it'll become interesting to see how you guys handle that. Speaking so Andy, of, you got... You got me wondering here, what's your prediction of where do you think that Citrix will? And I, I, I don't know. I have no idea. I'm just I'm asking this because there's a lot of smart people on the phone call. Do you think that Citrix is going to loosen the reins a little bit and start to allow the on prem environment to scale out the cloud again? You know, we 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 shrunk that functionality out. And do you think we'll be introducing that again? I mean, what's your prediction or your gut feelings? Oh, that's a, the, with all the change going on, I, I honestly don't know. I, kind, I think you kind of need to, as long as it continues to allow for subs subscription sales of licenses. Um, I, I think Citrus got a lot of ill will with customers when, when they made that kind of heavy handed change. Uh, I hope they do. Um, but I, I mean, I, I do I, real quick. I, I do agree with some of the support challenges with trying to on premises and as a service, manage those cloud relationships so i i from early on saw technically why citrix was doing it i just don't know if the uh the aesthetics of it was right go ahead sorry no for, i mean for me when we talk to customers about this i mean one of the things that we we have to tell them is you know you're landlocked for lack of a better word with your on-prem environment you you can't you can't scale out and i know there's various reasons for that and some can agree or some disagree but this is where the market's headed man i mean we live in a subscription world now and so i don't i don't you know 100 percent blame citrix for how they're trying to drive the market i mean it makes sense uh and i realize customers don't like it but i do find it interesting and to our listeners i don't know any more about this than what you're reading on the screen i mean I've always kind of assumed that on-prem is going to be on-prem. And if you want to get the scale out the cloud, well, guess what? You've got to move to our cloud platform because that's what it's about. So it'll be real interesting to me as an employee and also as a 25-year user to how we, you know, kind of go forward. You know, will we continue that stance of on-prem's landlocked, no cloud configuration, or will we start to loosen up and go, okay, we realize that we need to have that connectivity there for our customers to be able to do their next wave of, of uh, you know, moving forward. So I don't know, Monica, what are your thoughts? I'm interested to hear what you have to say about some of this. Yeah, I appreciate the conversation and I fully hear what all of you are saying. I, I will say just kind of as I started the beginning of this, this conversation in the beginning of this vlog is our our story is ever evolving. So the most important thing that we do as a company is hear and listen and see, but we also have internal processes, Ben, as what you're talking about of, you know, what's gonna work long-term. So I know as much about as much as y'all at this point, um, but I think we, we most definitely hear these conversations and we hear the pros and the cons of it all. So I'm curious to see where, where we'll go and I, I don't know. I, I think it's a, a great time to be a Citrite and a time of really seeing what works best. So I know that's a vague answer, but yeah. that's that's the best answer I have for you at the moment. But as soon as I get more clarity, I'd love to come back on and, and chat about it. So for our listeners, uh, you know, Monica and I are always in an interesting spot when we do these podcasts because we are representatives of, of Citrix. Uh, but Citrix is such a vast company, you know, 10,000 employees around the world that sometimes these things, you know, you know, your corner of the business. And uh, sometimes you have to get out of these podcasts and I have to go ask questions. So one thing I hope you appreciate is our honesty when we talk about some of these subjects. And, you know, for Citrix employees or Citrix managers that are listening to this, please, you know, appreciate our honesty. And we might not be giving the the best answers that Citrix would want us to give. But I think that's what makes this podcast so rich is we are being honest and we're being vulnerable. And we are, as Andy would say, we don't have all the answers and we're willing to admit that. So uh, I hope you appreciate that. But it does get interesting sometimes because I'm like, ooh, well, how do we take this? So uh, again, I think it's a great conversation and questions that customers are asking us and as individuals and, you know, professionals in this industry we're asking ourselves is where this goes so an interesting time uh to be a citrix employee and a citrix customer 
Agreed. Yes. Thanks for that disclaimer, Ben. <laughs> got about 11 minutes left. We hit the top of the hour. Uh, Google Cloud. Um, Monica, you got four highlights here. First one is support for Google Cloud. Customer managed encryption keys. Yep. This um, We now have support for Google's customer managed encryption keys with MCS catalogs. So really provides greater control and um, over the encryption of data. So I'll, I'll just keep rapid firing if that's okay, Andy. I know we're coming up on time. No, that's great. But we've introduced app layering support. So I know this is a beloved technology by our customers. So the, the app layering appliance or ELM is available in Google Cloud. So this is huge for customers who may be on Google Cloud, maybe not leveraging Citrix quite yet because they you know, are looking for this type of technology and now we've introduced it. Additionally, we've introduced shielded virtual sh machine support. So admins can now provision shielded virtual machines within Google Cloud. So this is really a security play against remote attacks. And then lastly, the MCS support we've introduced for resent suspending and resuming VMs. So if admins are looking to do this, this is great to optimize costs. So admins can dynamically suspend and resume their VMs without sacrificing user experience. So continuing to add to these, these hyperscalers. And we've also, um, yeah, we've just got a lot coming with all of the, the major cloud providers. So keep an eye out for that. So Monica, what you're really talking about, that's huge, right? The ability to, to basically pause a VM so you're not paying for consumption mm -hmm. when it's not in use. Uh, you know, Citrix admins that have been rolling out on on-premises hardware forever, we really didn't care that much. But as you get to the cloud, the you know, things that Citrix can do to add value in terms of saving you money, that's some of the big differentiators that, um, you know, Citrix is going to want to do, whereas maybe the cloud provider, if you're using their desktop solution, they don't want to do because that's that's counterproductive for them. They, they want you to, to, to spend through as many workloads as you can. Yep. All right. Uh, workspace environment manager enhancements. We have two noted here, faster cloud onboarding with uh, WIM and Citrix virtual app and desktop service. What's this one? Yeah. So, um, obviously, our WIM functionality optimizes your workspace environments, but this now onboarding feature has a WIM wizard workflow. So that's within the quick deploy UI of CVAD for just faster onboarding. So quicker time to value when leveraging WIM. And then the uh, FIPS compliant, which is pretty much a yep. one we're always chasing. Yep, for, <laughs> we are always chasing it. So now we have um, our, our new update ensures FIPS compliance for you know, government, healthcare, anyone that needs to to be under compliance regulations. So I think that's it. I know we moved pretty quickly, but that's all I had in the blog for today. Well, Monica, everybody can go out and read the blog as they need totally. to. Here is just to get people introduced some of the topics. Was there anything? Was there anything that you left off that just didn't quite make the list that uh, you think is important? So I will say last week, my colleague Adam Lotz put out a blog um, coming soon, introducing the new long-term service release. So we are slated on premises for the next long-term service release. We are targeting Q1 of next year. So again, talking to both, I know I talked a lot of cloud today, but also our on-prem customers were really excited about that coming out. So our last LTSR was in December of 2019, and we'll have just all of the features from then to now, including, as we've been talking about, Win 11 support, Server 2022 support. So should be a really great release. Ben, Bill, any uh, feature that hasn't shown up uh, in the various different stacks within here that you're, you guys are waiting on? Oh, goodness. Um, <laughs> not off the top of my head. I'm just happy to see they continue. we continue to innovate. Citrix continues to innovate here. And bring new good features to the product, both on-prem and in cloud. I think it's interesting that Bill said we by accident and then pulled back on that a little bit. That's that's how we see it, right? I mean- That is I, how I we see it. I just, you know, you know, yeah. When I get into tit for tat conversations, one technology versus another, I think whoever's arguing has no idea what all Citrix is doing to lead in this space and continues to invest in. I think, I think you can somewhat blame Citrix marketing on that too. You guys have gone away from this core's conversation as much 
uh, to go to some of those newer conversations that you know the industry analysts and the uh, the markets want you to want you to you know break down new walls and create new businesses. But at the end of the day, what you guys are doing around virtual app and desktop service on prem on premises, uh, pretty amazing stuff. Yeah, agreed. Ben Absolutely. Rogers, you still with us? Yeah, I am. My my closing comment would be: I think where we're really to one of the points you made during our, our conversation that I want to highlight is our ability to control cost in these cloud environments. You know, when you talk to customers, they go, oh, well, they can scale. I'm like, yeah, they can scale, but they got to have the infrastructure there to be able to scale into it. Our bill, our ability to be elastic, be able to grow it and then shrink it down is a cost savings. And I have seen a lot of cloud deals get crushed by the cost of running infrastructure that they didn't need that they were not managing. And so that's one of the things I really talk, try to talk to customers about is our ability to, to auto scale, not just scale, but be able to auto scale, be able to build it on demand and then be able to shrink it as it's not being used so that we can control, control costs. And so for our listeners out there that are looking at going to Azure, looking to go in the GCP, talk to us about how we can manage those environments and control your costs in those environments. Cause to your point, Andy, they're not, they're not trying to do any, you any favors on that end. They want that consumption dollar. And what we want to be able to do is show how you can control that and you manage that, not only in Azure, but across multiple platforms. Yeah, yeah I, I'll argue with anyone. Number one barrier to growth of Citrix and other technologies like it is total cost of ownership. Um, complexity has been there for a while, but a lot of the service stuff has helped with that a ton. Uh, but total cost of ownership stops most of our successful customers from moving further forward. Uh, because they just can't figure out how they're going to pay for it. It's not Citrix. It's the total cost of everything else that goes along with it that's killing them. Oh, we've seen some, I mean, one customer, I'm not going to say any names, but we've seen some outrageous Azure costs that they've had to really take a step back and go, wait a minute, we didn't, we didn't see this piece of the puzzle. And what we're talking to them about is let us use our technology to help you control that cost. They bought the product, set the environment up, didn't really come back and ask us any questions and started getting pummeled with bills. And we're like, wait a minute, you have the ability to control this. So it's allowed us to get back in there and have a, a, a more rich conversation with them. But really, if you're if you're looking at putting this out there, let us tell you how we can control that cost for you. And hey Ben, sounds like that customer needs a better partner. Oh, I have to, I'll have to go back. It's not my customer. I'll go back to the engineer and talk, but I was shocked when, when, you know, we've been talking about consumption and looking at customers consumption and this person had a really low and we got into why, and then it just shocked me when they. It was just a chance to get a, get a dig in. Right. I mean, I started my company <laughs> nine years ago because uh, nobody ever challenges the the status quo in terms of what people are spending. And that's, that's the biggest the, the biggest threat Citrix has and has had since you know, the, the late nineties, really, or certainly since the late uh, 2000s, 2009 timeframe, uh, VDI was a big part of that guys. We got to go. I'm out of time. Uh, thanks Monica for joining us. Love to have you on next time. Yeah. Thanks for having me. Thanks all. Thank you. Have a good one, everybody.